All over the desert regions of southwest Idaho, raging rivers carve huge trenches deep into the earth, leaving behind canyons of spectacular beauty. The Bruno, the Owyhee River Canyon, the Snake River Birds of Prey area. Even here along the Boise River, these basalt cliffs bear witness to the incredible power of a roaring river. But nowhere is it more dramatic than in the deep gorge of Hell's Canyon. I'm Wayne Walker. Tonight, incredible Idaho descends the snake into the heart of Hell's Canyon. Steeped in history, shimmering with heat, it plummets 7,900 feet from rim to river, forming the deepest canyon in North America. Winding like a serpent along the floor of this chasm is the Snake River, somewhat tamed, but not defeated. It forms a watershed for a vast region of the mountainous west, stretching nearly a thousand miles. Along the way, it's drained and dammed until it arrives here at the last of the middle Snake River dams, Hell's Canyon. 140 miles further downstream, it will be dammed again when it turns west towards the Columbia. But now, for the rest of its journey north, it flows free, designated by the federal government as a wild and scenic river. Say when you think, Rick. I'd say about there. Okay, just straight forward. Uh, Strap right up around there. here if you can get it. Just below Hell's Canyon Dam is a launch site for this spectacular stretch of river. Jet boats, commercial raft trips, and private floaters crowd the ramp, taking turns unloading gear and supplies. This portion of the river is managed by the Forest Service. At the beginning of the year, a limited number of permits are drawn on a lottery system and launch dates are assigned. Universal signal for if you're in the water, okay. Hat, head, on, or hand on top of your head. Oh, nice water. But this is a working trip for Butch Welch, a conservation officer with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Oop, we got to redo one strap there. Gotta... He's designated as a backcountry patrol officer, and in Idaho, that covers a lot of territory. You know, we're still regular game wardens. We just don't have assigned patrol areas. We help everybody else in the region. We come hunting season, and uh, this time of year, we can go out, make our presence known in the backcountry, and we're not leaving the patrol area vacant. Couldn't ask for better weather, it's not too hot. Part of the job for Butch and fellow officer Rick Cooper will be to check fishing licenses and sturgeon tags. In a jet boat, you usually don't slow down. You're looking at the water. You just kind of buzz from people to people and check fishermen. Uh, doing a patrol in a raft is kind of a, a totally different situation. You're not really looking to check as many people. You're not in uniform. Uh, it's really really a pretty effective way of, uh, of doing a patrol. Well, are we catching any fish yet? The long pole at the stern is a sturgeon rod. You guys fishing on Idaho licenses? Okay, guys, yeah, I'm C.W. Welch with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game, and here's my ID. And we're down here on the river checking fishermen, seeing how everybody's doing, if they're having a good time on the river. That's not a hard thing to do down here. That's right. How long y'all been fishing? Don DeMond and his party came up from Nampa to spend a whole week in the canyon, fishing, camping, and enjoying the outdoors. The fishing's always good. The, the weather is always normally real nice, nice and hot. And uh, we just love to do this kind of thing. Both Butch and Rick say that most license checks are like this one an enjoyable experience. And actually, it's been one of the funnest parts of the job in the almost 19 years I've been an officer is, you know, you get those guys every once in a while that wake up on the wrong side of the bed or they get, uh, we encounter them in a, in a violation situation. But by and large, most people are, are decent folks. I've met some great people, good friends. They're glad to see us out, you know. More than once I've heard that. Well, nice to see you guys are here. The trip also gives Butch and Rick the opportunity to answer any questions anglers may have. In addition, 
They'll report habitat information and fishing success to wildlife and fisheries managers back in the office. Well, the only time I get to come into the canyon on a regular basis is when we do our aerial survey work for elk and for deer. And that doesn't occur but once probably every five years or so. And since it is from a helicopter, we're I mean, certainly looking at it from a different perspective. Kayaker Jay Crenshaw is the wildlife manager for the Clearwater region, which includes the canyon. One of his concerns here is the disease problems that have plagued the bighorn sheep in this area. Well, certainly we're spending more time evaluating what's here in the canyon more recently because of the opportunities to try to stimulate the sheep population by having some transplants both on this side in Idaho but also on the Oregon and Washington sides as well. Jay joined the float trip both to evaluate habitat at ground level and to add a safety element as an experienced kayaker. That's a real advantage of having the kayak along on a trip because if anybody does run into trouble, then you can uh, go after an individual, and pull them to shore, or help somebody if they've run into some other kind of problem. And if a raft does flip, then sometimes it's pretty critical to act right away. But there's no serious rapids on this first leg of the journey. It's a comfortable float and a good opportunity to study the changes produced by nature in this high water year. Well, when, when you get in a dam situation like we've got here on the snake, um, it kind of interrupts, obviously, the, the normal flows and the high waters and the way it deposits the sediments. Uh, so when we get some good high flows like we had this year, it'll kind of scour out the bottom and then take up that sand and deposit it where you know, it would have normally been in a normal river situation. It's the height of summer, long, hot, sunny days and warm nights. The moon is on its downward slide, rising late at night and staying visible long past dawn. Even in this unusually lush year, the hillsides have begun to succumb to the heat. The long grasses are drying up and slowly bleaching from rich green to a faded golden brown. The world slows down here, call it river time and perspectives narrow to the water, the sun, the cliffs, and the ghosts of all who have traveled here over the centuries. Get this back. Hey, Jay, what about that camp spot up there on the hill? Look like it could be a nice spot. Right here. Next on Incredible Idaho, we'll visit Chimney Bar. First people in the canyon, well, depending on the expert, uh, most people will tell you that there were people in Hell's Canyon anywhere from 2,000 to 7,000 years ago. They came in here for the same reasons that every single person that followed them did, because of our climate. We're only about 1,500 feet above sea level here, so we have a very mild, temperate winter climate. Traces remain of native peoples who traveled the canyon long before Columbus began his journey to America. Faded petroglyphs are barely visible, a splash of red on the rock that tells an ancient tale long forgotten. These historical fragments make Chimney Bar a popular stopping point for jet boat tours like this one. This is the remains of a pit house. Now the way these worked, they would dig out a circle to the, um, to the size they wanted, Guide Linda Mink gives guests a thorough education on the remaining evidence of ancient habitation. Now the unique thing about this particular style of pit house is the fact that it only had one opening. He and his family mined it for a few years and then about 1910 a mining company offered them $10,000 for that claim. Jet boats provide an alternative to floating and for many older folks or people with young children it may be the only means to see this beautiful canyon. The deepest part of the canyon is going to be down about 16 miles from here. The highest point on the Oregon side will be Half Point Lookout at an elevation of, of 7,200 feet above sea level. Tourists are treated to a mix of history and geological facts while they slowly cruise the canyon in the shady comfort of the big boat. But for the rafters and kayaker on Bush's crew, it was a working day. And as every shrewd captain knows, a well-fed crew is a happy crew. 
and the best insurance against mutiny. It just so happens that Butch Welch is a gourmet Dutch oven cook with one cookbook already out on the market and another in the works. It's no surprise then that the crew members are willing guinea pigs for a new recipe Butch has dreamed up. It's poached salmon steak, a big one his son caught right here in Idaho with a rice side dish and a raspberry rhubarb dessert Butch calls dump cake. All we're going to do to start with is going to chop some garlic, add some dill, put it in a 10 inch dutch, a little lemon, a little butter. We're going to re reduce that down and then we're going to put that on our salmon steaks as we, uh, when we put them in the dutch to cook them. So that's all we're going to do. Butch's philosophy on backcountry cooking is pretty straightforward. You can eat weenies and beans or you can eat well. Oh, and everything you eat should have plenty of garlic. Well, I measure by the handful and the hatful. Actually, I don't know where my measuring spoons are. I have no idea. Dutch ovens have been part of the American West since the Mountain Men days. To save on weight, aluminum models have replaced cast iron on river trips, but the basic shape remains the same. OK, we're just going to put this on the stove and get it reducing. Butch is using the camp stove to reduce his sauce, but he'll also fire up some charcoal for cooking the salmon and baking the dessert. It's a little more comfortable when you have a cool dish to go uh, on a day like today. So we got a rice, it's cooling in the cooler. We're gonna dice up uh, some veggies, stir it up in our rice, and then dress that with a little olive oil, a little lemon juice, and a little white wine. Hope everybody likes onions. It's shaping up to be a colorful dish, so Butch promptly names it Rainbow Rice. As he's slicing and dicing, he explains the appeal of Dutch oven cooking. Well, you know, the, there's nothing more versatile than a Dutch oven. And we can cook in them, we can fry in them, we can roast in them, we can bake in them. Butch and mixes olive oil and you know, lemon juice with the chopped vegetables and sets them aside. Next. He drops margarine in the bottom of a couple of large Dutch ovens and puts them on the charcoal to melt. To this, he adds a dry white wine and then begins to lay the salmon steaks on top. And then uh, one of my favorite spices for just about any kind of fish is dill. And so uh, we're going to add uh, just a sprinkling of dill here. Now it's time for the special and, sauce. Uh, we're just going to take a little bit of that and uh, put over our steaks. Butch will stack the two Dutch ovens containing the salmon steaks. He begins by arranging a few charcoals in sort of a circle and then starts building his tower. What that does is uh, you can cook a lot more. You end up with a, a column of heat and you get by with a lot less charcoal. And uh, in order to keep from burning something when you're decking it like this, you keep your heat, almost all of it on the outside. It makes it more of an oven type effect when you put your briquettes around there and we'll only put a, just a, a couple in the center. Which estimates right 20 there. minutes until the steaks are done. Our salmon steaks are going, let's uh, get another Dutch and make dessert. This dish, too, begins with melted margarine. On top of that, put spoons in a can of raspberry pie filling and some rhubarb from his garden. Then he adds a store-bought cake mix. Call this a backcountry flour sifter if you want. We're just going to put that cake mix in there, and we're not going to use any of the other ingredients. Kind of mash them lumps up. He puts a few pats of margarine on top and then dumps in the last ingredient, a bottle of 7-Up. It's been a wild boat ride today. That 7-Up just about got away from us. And just pour it in gently. The whole works goes on the charcoal, and a bit later, Butch does his famous smell test to see if everything's done. If you can't smell it, it's not done. If it smells done, it's done. If it smells burnt, it's burnt. His nose is right on target. The Dutch ovens yield a savory salmon steak done perfectly. 
will be a happy, well-fed crew that takes on wild sheep and granite rapids in the morning. Had a fresh off the fire. Coming up, a wild ride through wild sheep and granite rapids. big ones like this, it's worth getting out and looking at them. The next day dawns hot and clear. Typical summer weather for the heart of Hell's Canyon. The moon still hangs over the horizon, slow to leave the morning sky. A rising sun catches spiders suspended in midair, resting after a busy night of spinning their silken webs. They belong to a family of spiders called orb weavers, known for their intricate webs and poor eyesight. They locate prey by feeling the vibration of the captured insect in the threads of their webs. Now, if you watch carefully, you'll see a grasshopper abruptly hit the web in the lower left of your screen. The spider is there in an instant. She begins to rapidly spin her prey with her front legs, while her fourth set of legs wrap it in a silken sheet. The female orb weaver is much larger than her male counterpart. Later this fall, she'll produce several hundred eggs and then die. But now, she's the huntress, killing the captive grasshopper with a venomous bite. The drama over, she attaches a long thread to her prey and slowly drags it up to the center of her deadly web. You know, when, you know, when the guy pulls back, he doesn't want to pull too far too fast and hit that little hole and lose it there. Butch and Rick are scouting wild sheep rapids, turbulent at any flow, and the longest one on the river. Jay goes first in the kayak, almost disappearing under a wall of water. The two rafts are next, plunging into the fray. Butch's boat, heavy with gear, seems to almost plow through the waves instead of rolling over them. But all arrive intact. Oh yeah. You know, I, you know, I don't care how long you've run the river. Uh, you look at that, and the, and the power is enormous there. And uh, about the time you start taking stuff for granted is about the time a guy gets in trouble. The next challenge is Granite Creek Rapids. The guidebook warns of large drops with holes and big waves. Butch is well aware of the dangers. He got dumped out of his boat and ended up swimming these rapids a few years ago. Well, I, w I was thinking of when a guy comes off that tongue, if he could be just to the Oregon side. Again, it's the kayak that tackles it first. You get a little knot in your stomach, and uh, mainly it's a question of picking a line where you can get some adrenaline flowing, but at the same time have as much fun and have a safe ride through. Jay makes it look easy. Then Rick does a perfect line with his boat, and Butch follows up right on target. Although he salutes the camera in victory, he admits later that his stomach was pretty knotted up. Now he's triumphant, conquering the rapids, that had beaten him in the past. Next on Incredible Idaho, step back in time at the historic Kirkwood Ranch. The first white settlers in the canyon were miners looking for copper and gold, but hard on their heels, came the homesteaders. In the 1860s, Congress passed a law declaring that a family could stake a 160-acre homestead on public land. After five years of living there and working the land, it could be bought for a mere $26. Today, the remains of these homesteads are scattered up and down the heart of Hell's Canyon. Most of them have been preserved by the Forest Service 
as part of the Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area. The museum at Kirkwood Historical Ranch tells the stories of the early pioneers. Fish and game were plentiful, and the grassy hillsides provided exceptionally good forage for sheep and cattle. But wood for building shelters and fences was difficult to obtain. None was wasted. When owner Carl Hanna didn't return from World War I, his old homesteader's cabin was disassembled and moved down the slope to be used as a blacksmith shop for Kirkwood Ranch. On the flats above the Snake River, running water was scarce. Elaborate irrigation systems were constructed, diverting creeks for use in homes and gardens and all the big equipment necessary for farming the land had to be brought in by barge. Today, for the most part, the heart of Hell's Canyon is once again public land. And so, the deepest canyon in North America, this place of spectacular beauty, can be enjoyed by all.